I think my military Humvee turned electric is pretty darn cool, but not cool enough. Today we're gonna make it a little cooler on the inside by adding a 50-50 blend of ethylene glycol and deionized water, which I think looks pretty cool. This also means though we have to construct an entire cooling system built from manifolds, hoses, and radiators to circulate that coolant throughout the entire vehicle. Should be pretty cool. This video is sponsored by Audible, and we have a ton of cool information to go over, so let's get started. Back when my electric Humvee had its engine, it needed a whole lot of cooling. Look at the size of this radiator compared to the engine it was cooling down. The engine needed a lot of cooling because of the combustion happening inside of it, little fireballs exploding to propel the vehicle forward. Without any cooling, the engine would overheat, seize up, and very quickly die. Due to these explosions happening inside, a gas-powered engine is only 30 to 40% efficient, meaning for every dollar of fuel you put in your tank, 30 cents of it goes to pushing your vehicle forward, and 70 cents gets burned away and lost as heat. Which is all rather unfortunate considering the current gas prices. Electric motors, however, are very different. For example, the motor we put inside of the military Humvee is 94% efficient, so as the energy is flowing through it, only 6% is lost as heat. And you might be asking yourself, hey Jerry, what about the batteries? And those are even more efficient than the motor. The 100 kilowatt hour pack of batteries we have back here is 95% efficient, meaning we're only losing about 5% as the pack is charging up and discharging as we roll forward. So if we do the math, knowing that these new electric components are way more efficient than the previous ones, we know we can get away with a way smaller cooling system than what we had before. If we were working with a small enough vehicle, we might be able to get away with no cooling system at all, just having air-cooled batteries and motors. But with how big this is and how unaerodynamic it is, we do have to have some kind of liquid circulation. We'll talk more about aerodynamics in a minute because it is rather fascinating. We also have to remember when designing the cooling system that this one was designed to operate in around 220 degrees Fahrenheit, while the max temperature for our system needs to top out about a 140. So while the radiator can indeed be smaller, we're gonna put it right here, it still needs to be large enough to handle the smaller temperature range. All we need for this project is a bunch of hose, the coolant pump, the radiators, and some fans. In order for us to talk about the cooling system inside of the battery boxes, we have to go back in time to before everything was connected. Building the manifold inside the box is relatively straightforward. We're using stainless steel for the manifold and we have to line our tubing up with the spouts on the back of the battery modules. These connections back here are an inlet and an outlet. You can kind of see all the 18650s, all the silver things up inside of here. That way liquid can flow in one side and out the other. A supply and a return. First we take these double-sided nipples and cut them in half. As we don't have a lathe, we are sticking the nipple inside of a drill and rotating it against a bandsaw. As always, don't do this at home, but it does get the job done. Then we can take those same split in half nipples and bring them over to the vise, where we've clamped down a step drill bit and we can spin the cut nipple inside of the step drill bit to deburr it which gets rid of the sharp metal flanges inside of the nipple. The three quarter inch metal tubing that the liquid's gonna flow through needs to be taken over to the drill press where we've punched and marked out some holes where we can weld the nipples onto. Once again, this just allows liquid to throw through the 18 battery module to keep things cool. You might have noticed as well that we have two tanks of gas. One plugged into the torch and the other plugged into the backside of the pipe. Now obviously I'm not the welder here, but what I'm told is this is a full penetration well and we need argon flowing through both ends so that it doesn't oxidize inside of the pipe. That way the inside of the pipe stays clean and it won't contaminate the coolant that will be pushing through it. Which is why we have this piece of rubber covering the hose barb as well as all of the other holes I drilled blocked off so that the argon can escape while it's being backfilled here in this particular spot. 
So we've talked quite a bit about how this Humvee is going to be powered. We're using Tesla battery modules, 450 volts worth. But batteries, as they charge and discharge, create heat, and that heat needs to be dissipated. Just like gasoline likes to work within certain temperature ranges, the batteries are the same way. Lithium's ideal temperature is between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but can operate in much wider ranges. I'm gonna ramble on for a second. The spec list for the 18650 Panasonic cells that are inside of these Tesla battery modules say that it likes to charge between zero and 45 C, discharge between negative 20 and 60, and likes to be stored at negative 20 to 50. These lithium batteries can be discharged in a super wide range of temperatures, like this handy graph I made below. And the liquid cooling and sometimes heating is used to keep the batteries centered within that range, especially since the charging window is a little more narrower than the discharging window. This is why Teslas usually turn off the regenerative braking when it gets below freezing. That way it doesn't damage the batteries and keeps things safe. You can see the cooling ribbon starts here with this fitting and the hollow tube runs lengthwise all the way down the module, comes back here, loops down, there and back, loops again, there and back, running between all of the cells. And as the coolant flows through the module, it leaches the heat, pulls it away and takes it back to the radiator, which can then cool it back down before it circulates again. Very, very similar to what happens in a diesel or gas powered engine, just on a smaller scale. There's less heat to dissipate when using more efficient batteries. The blue hose we're using is just silicone, designed to work with the glycol mixture we're using as coolant, it's the same coolant that runs through gas-powered vehicles. And the hose should allow us the flexibility to move inside of the box as we put it down inside of the Humvee. It'll make more sense when you see it. We're crimping the hose onto Jacob's welds with mechanical interlock clamps. These are permanent, since once they're inside of the box, they're not coming back out. And the manifold is now populated and we can clip everything up into place, just like little Legos. And since they're permanently clamped, they'll never vibrate loose, no matter how extreme our off-roading gets. So remember how we welded this manifold with the argon gas flowing through it? Well, there's not a whole lot of contaminants on the inside, but there are some burrs from when we drilled the holes through the nipples. So we're gonna clean out those little metal imperfections with a hone. which we welded onto a bar of all thread, and it does a pretty good job of getting rid of the dirt. Obviously, before we want to flow glycol through the system, we want to see if it can pressurize. We have this pressure differential gauge and for some reason it measures in inches of water, but apparently 30 inches of water is one PSI. And since the batteries are only supposed to go to about two PSI, it's a good metric for testing. Unfortunately though, we can tell there is some kind of pinhole leak because the pressure does drop, which means we have to find where the hole is. To find the leak, we're adding coolant. This is the same coolant that we'll be adding when the box is finished. It's the pre-diluted antifreeze. And this coolant is actually pre-diluted with deionized water, which is non-conductive. Once we've filled up the module, we can pressurize it using a new gauge that goes up to five PSI. We're sticking to two just to test it. Then we can wait and see where any liquid spills out. The blue liquid is quite a bit easier to see than air. And there it is, luckily it's not inside a module, but actually one of our stainless steel welds. The weld has a small pinhole leak in the side, but it's easy enough to fix. Melting the metal back together seals the hole, allows us to put the manifold back into place to be repressurized. All right, round two, we finally have everything connected back up, repressurized, sitting just shy of two PSI, and we will see if there's any more leaks. If this stays solid, then we're good to throw it in a box and plop it in the Humvee. 
So it's been 24 hours now and it's maintained its pressure, which means we found all of the leaks. What's interesting though is as the temperature fluctuates in this room, the gauge will move three tenths of a PSI. When the heaters are on, it'll expand, and when the heaters are off and it's cold, the gauge will move down. I'm not an expert in the laws of thermodynamics, I just think that's pretty cool. Now for the box and putting it in. So last time we were assembling the boxes, there was some concern in the comments about these being too close to the wall. So what we're gonna do is we shrunk it in towards the battery a bit, and we are gonna put some heat shrink over the connection, which will make more sense when I show down there. The heat shrink is large enough that it fits over the whole bus bar as well as the nut and can provide one additional layer of protection. Nothing inside of this box will ever slide around. The grooves in the top plate keep things from shifting, but there's no harm in having multiple upon multiple layers of protection. The white sock looking thing behind the wire that you're seeing is actually a fiberglass finger protector for when you're TIG welding. It lets the heat focus on the heat shrink instead of getting on the plastic module protection. These seven modules are now sealed, liquid tested, and pressure ready. It's time for these seven modules. I won't make you watch the whole thing though. And it's done. It has also been 24 hours. We have pressurized the system and we are good to go. It's maintained itself. Through the power of editing, watching this project takes a whole lot less time than actually doing the project. Now obviously if you're watching this video, you already know we've mounted these boxes. If you're confused as to what happens next, go watch the mounting video where we put the metal boxes over top and stuck them in the Hummer. Now back to the hoses, coolant, and radiator. And here we are back again with the hoses, coolant, and radiator. Let's talk about aerodynamics for a second. It's kind of been the elephant in the room that we haven't mentioned it yet, mostly because there is no aerodynamics. But I think now's a good time to mention it, because the easier it is for something to move through the air, the less energy it takes to propel it forward, the less battery it consumes, and the less heat it generates. A really cool YouTube channel called AirShaper reached out and asked if he could do a 3D analysis on the aerodynamics of the military Humvee and compare it to the aerodynamics of a Tesla Model X, which is about the same weight and range as what we have here, yet very, very different looking on the outside. If we take a look at the analysis that happened inside of the AirShaper software, we can see that my Hummer has the aerodynamicness of a brick wall. All of this red is friction from the air or turbulence, which means at high speeds, say 60 miles an hour, It'll take a lot of work for the motor to push the Hummer forward, since all this wind is creating drag and slowing us down, working against us. And most of the power coming from the batteries at that speed will be used to overcome the air resistance. There's a lot of drag coming from the exposed wheels in the front, as well as the exposed undercarriage. Having the bottom open does make things easier to work on, but there's a reason every other electric vehicle, like my Rivian, have solid bottoms underneath. With everything covered up with a solid flat surface, there's less places for the air to get caught underneath to slow us down. All said and done, my Hummer has a drag coefficient of 0.82, which is actually extremely terrible. Most regular vehicles or cars have a drag coefficient of around 0.35. The sharp angles and flat panels perpendicular to the wind create more turbulent air patterns, which in turn slows us down at high speeds. If you've ever put your head out the window on the freeway to let the wind flow through your hair like I do, you know what kind of forces we're fighting against at high speeds. Let's take a look at the wind tunnel analysis of the Tesla Model X. The Tesla Model X has a pretty amazing drag coefficient of 0.24, far better than the average car. That means the wind resistance has a much lower effect at the high speeds. If we consider the wind factor alone at highway speeds, my Hummer will use three times more energy moving forward and get three times less range than the Model X, purely because of its shape. Aerodynamics at highway speeds is a huge deal. And as you can see from the Model X, there is no drag coming from underneath or as much from the wheels. So based purely on shape alone, if everything else was equal and our battery packs were the same, my Hummer is about three times less aerodynamic than the Model X. Above about 40 miles an hour is where air resistance really comes into play. Around town though, or off-roading, is where the Humvee's gonna excel. We didn't build it to be a road trip vehicle, and if worse comes to worse, we can just drive over the Model X if we need to. 
I'll link the Air Shaper YouTube channel down below if you want to learn more about aerodynamics or upload your own project to test out. Maybe in the future I'll build a giant carbon fiber nose cone to put in the front so we can uh, squeak out a few extra miles on the freeway. In order for us to do the range test, we have to get this radiator and pump installed in the Hummer. Picking a radiator, fan, and pump combo for my EV was pretty tough. I could have reused the old radiator of course, but that would have been overkill, be super heavy, and would just take up way too much space. I decided to go with a custom radiator system from Delta PAG. I purchased the whole setup because they could custom fit the radiator to the space I had, along with using super efficient components that would suit a super efficient electric vehicle. The variable low profile brushless fans are 91% efficient and can move over 2,800 cubic feet of air in just a minute. The fans can also be controlled by my BMS, which means they'll only kick on when they're needed, preserving the silent operation of the Humvee. It also has a screen of its own that I can program what temperature I want the fans to kick on at, which I can use instead of the BMS if I need to. And everything's made right here in the USA. We do need to physically attach them to the Humvee though, and we can do that with lasers. We're back at Oshkut again using their lasers to cut out the brackets for the pump and the radiator. The laser behind me uses a ton of power. It's an eight kilowatt laser, but factoring in all of the electricity going into it to move the laser around, my Hummer could only power it for about three hours. There is a ton of energy being used to slice through this metal, but that makes it all the more fun to watch. With both the pump bracket and radiator bracket cut out, we can take it over the finisher to deburr the edges, and then to the bending machine, which takes our 2D design and brings it into a 3D space so we can actually use it. I mounted all the electronics on the inside of the fender, kind of a little alcove here that perfectly fits all the relays and display, almost like the Humvee was made for it. I added some heavy duty Velcro on the back to help minimize vibrations and add some additional holding power since the screw holes seemed rather small. Then I can run the wires needed to power this thing to the brains of the 12 volt system that's hidden underneath the passenger seat. So how does a radiator actually decrease the temperature of the coolant inside of the Humvee? Let's get a little bit weird for a second. Imagine yourself in a nice hot steamy shower. The temperature next to the shower head is super, super warm, but if you crouch down near the floor, the water is much colder. The radiator acts in the same way. Due to the water falling through the air, it decreases in temperature very rapidly and the radiator lets the coolant do the exact same thing just in a closed loop where the water isn't leaking everywhere. Air flows through the radiator naturally or is pulled through by fans, and as the tremendous airflow passes through the fins, the coolant leaving the other side of the radiator is a much lower temperature than when it entered at the beginning. Next time you're in the shower, you'll have to try it out for yourself. I think we're done running all the plumbing, but let me catch you up to speed before we put liquid inside. So obviously we start here with the radiator. We put liquid inside of this fill cap here. We have all the electronics, which I'll show you in a second. Then we go to the pump, and the pump has this massive inlet and two outlets, one doing a loop for the inverter, the motor, and then back here to the radiator. 
and the other outlet is running back to the battery banks, which I showed you earlier. We have a return line coming up this side and going back in to the radiator. And all of our hoses are crimped and super secure, so no liquid should be leaking out. Let me show you the electronics. If we come back over here, if you remember the brains of the 12 volt system, we have the battery here, and if you need a refresher on how this works, you can go back and watch the brains of the 12 volt system. Long story short, when we turn the key on, the electronics for the radiator will kick on and run the pump consistently. The fans will only turn on when it gets to a high enough temperature. The cooling system will also turn on when it's plugged into the wall, because that is another moment when the batteries need cooling. Even without liquid in the system, if I turn the key, we should hear the pump start moving, which we don't want to do for very long, because the pump itself needs liquid inside to stay cool. So as we watch this coolant circulate through the system, let me tell you about the coolest audiobook I've listened to lately from our channel sponsor, Audible. This electric Humvee project has been insanely cool and educational for me. Learning about heat dissipation, efficiencies, and aerodynamics all in one video while making something super epic has been pretty awesome. If you've enjoyed this video, I am 100% confident you will enjoy listening to The Hail Mary Project by Andy Weir. He's the same guy who wrote The Martian. It's about a lone astronaut tasked with saving the entire planet from space using science and bits of his own spaceship. It's like an intergalactic version of the Hummer Project. You don't have to take my word for it though, it's also one audiobook of the year, and you can listen to it for free with a 30-day trial of Audible with the link down in the description, audible.com slash jerryrig, or text the word jerryrig to 500, 500 Plus, if you already have Amazon Prime, you get two free audiobooks. For the second one, I recommend The Martian, written by the same guy. Both are pretty epic audiobooks and some of my all-time favorites. You'll also get access to Audible's Plus catalog with podcasts, Audible originals, guided fitness, and meditation programs, and an additional free audiobook every month. It's a sweet deal. Personally, I've been subscribed to Audible for over five years now, so I'm a pretty big fan, and I think you will be too. Audible.com slash jerryrig or text jerryrig to 500-500. And if you don't like it, you can cancel whenever you want. There are no long-term contracts, and you get to keep the audiobook you got for free. Just how we like it. Huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Let's get back and see how that coolant is doing. So now the pump is going to turn on. The pump is still running behind me. It is super, super quiet. The only thing we can hear is kind of like the trickling stream of liquid inside of the tubes, as well as the gurgling of the spout. As air makes its way out of the system and out the inlet. With coolant filling up the system, I'm gonna leave it overnight to make sure there's no leaks in the system. Hopefully no puddles appear underneath the Humvee. And while it might be one entire night for me, it'll just be a couple seconds for you. That was a fast few seconds. Good morning. There are no drips underneath. And yes, I am wearing the same shirt. Epic shirts like this deserve to be worn every day. $17.99. I'll leave a link down in the description. It's got all the specs of the Humvee on the back. And because there's no drips down underneath, I think it's safe enough for us to go on our first drive. And even though we have all the paperwork and the thing is legal to drive on the road, I still feel like I should wear a helmet or something. Before we put the hood on and drive, it is currently 54 degrees Fahrenheit inside of the radiator. And I will set my laptop up in here so we can real time watch the temperature of the batteries. And here's the laptop. With our live information, we have the highest battery temperature and lowest battery temperature, which is sitting right at 10 degrees Celsius, which is right at what our fans are seeing around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, uh, let's see how it looks after a couple minutes of driving.
Mark's battery temperature is 13 degrees Celsius, so we barely did anything. And we've been driving for, let's see, about 19 minutes. Pretty solid. And that's well within the operating temperature of the batteries. Let's check out the motor. Yeah. And underneath the hood, we are at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which once again is well within operational temperature even after 20 minutes. Gas or diesel? Electric. <laughs> that isn't stuff. No. That's pretty cool. shift easy so this thing kind of rattles around like a bucket of bolts probably because it is still a bucket of bolts but I'm pretty excited. It's cool to see that the cooling system's working, the electrical working. There's still a lot that we need to do on it. So I imagine we'll have one or two more videos before we go, you know, off-roading or do any range tests. But I'm pretty happy with how things are going. And it's nice that we can actually drive it around without worrying about anything overheating. Anyway, if you have any questions, leave them down below. Come hang out with me on Instagram and Twitter. And as always, thanks a ton for watching. It's been a fun project. I'll see you around.